Hello, my friend and friends. Today's video is one that I'm absolutely thrilled to be bringing you as I was lucky enough to have a chance to have an in-depth talk with Jen Simmons, where we got to talk about the state of CSS today, how it's got to where it is now, including an interesting discussion on how Flexbox not only changed how we make layouts, but it also changed some of how browsers approach things when it comes to introducing new features as well. We also talk about Safari and how it's been leading the way on a lot of the new big features like has and container queries amongst a bunch of other ones and dive into how developers actually can influence what browsers are working on or prioritizing and a whole bunch of other stuff as well. And just in case you don't know who Jen is, she's currently a web technologies evangelist at Apple working on the web developer experience team for Safari and WebKit. She's also a member of the CSS working group and she was one of the people who helped usher in Grid uh, to the world of CSS and and educate us all on how it worked. She also introduced the idea of intrinsic web design and she's just done so much other stuff for the web as well. And I'm just absolutely thrilled that I had this chance to talk to her. So let's finally get to, to the interview itself. Let's go. First of all, Jen, I just want to say thank you so much for, for coming and joining me for this. I'm really looking forward to it. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. I'm really excited. Yeah, this is a great show. It's just, <laughs> I have a warm spot in my heart for teaching CSS on, on the internet through videos. So it's great. Yeah. Oh, thank you so much. That means a lot to me. <laughs> yeah. So I guess the first thing I want to talk about is we're going to sort of, but you know, sort of speaking about having a, a channel devoted to CSS, it sort of yeah. turned out to be a really good time to start one. Cause I never imagined the way that CSS would evolve, um, so much. Because it mm -hmm. seemed like CSS was really stable for a really long time. Whereas now it seems like every time a browser's updated and I look at a change log, I'm like, mm -hmm. oh, I have five new things I need to learn about. <laughs> and I'm just curious, um, since you know some of the behind the scenes stuff going on, like why the pace of change might seem so much faster. Yeah, well, I think there were reasons that the pace was slower before, and then those reasons changed. So some of it was, and I wasn't involved in the CSS work group during a lot of this. So I've heard the stories a little bit secondhand, so they might be a little bit overly summarized. But my sense is that, from what I've heard, is that there was, that CSS itself, it was written in the specification that later was called like the CSS1 specification. And it was pretty basic, pretty solid idea, but it took many years before browsers really had support for it. And then CSS2 came along, the spec got much longer, the, the web standard got much longer, but it still was very underspecified. There weren't a lot of details about what each of those things were supposed to do. So you ended up, for example, with, hey, if you set a width on a box and then you give that box padding, is that padding supposed to make the box wider or is the box supposed to stay the same size and the padding goes on the inside of that width? Like it was different in different browsers because yeah. the web standard wasn't super clear. And then there was a movement to say, okay, well, that's really not working out very well. Uh, how about we make the web standards be incredibly detailed, which took a lot of time to go through and be like, no, it's going to work exactly like this. If you took a float and you put it inside a table cell and then you did something else crazy with that, then this is exactly how it should work. So that that way every browser was identical and not only identical in how the features work, but like identical in how buggy code works. So that if a developer out there writes code that's actually has bugs in it, that those bugs work the same in every browser. It took years to go through all of CSS2 and give it that level of attention. And the CSS 2.2 specification was really kind of like, okay, finally, we've got all the details into all the things that have been invented over the last, whatever that was at that point, 10 or 15 years. And once that was done, then the working group could start tackling CSS3 and adding more new features. And the first features that got added were all kind of, um, you know, like rounded corners and sort of basic things. And there was a bit of a backlog of like, a, you know, a bunch of ideas that people had had over the years, but the working group was just trying to get the basics into a really good shape before they could move on. And then it felt like, I think, my sense is that the most urgent need at that point was layout, that the web needed better layout models and better layout tools. So yeah, we got Flexbox and Grid and those, some of those specifications are incredibly complicated. The algorithms for determining how layout works are hard. So those were massive projects. And then 
like, okay, that stuff got done. And then it feels like, all right, everybody knows that CSS is a thing because for a long time it wasn't, or some people really believed in it, but other people didn't. Um, everybody agreed to stop using tables for layout or whatever techniques were being used in the 90s and the early 2000s. And with everybody bought in, both developers and browsers, it feels like uh, also there's more, I think, of an understanding of how important it is for there to be three parts to the web that you've got HTML, you've got CSS, and you've got JavaScript, and they each have their roles. And it's like the closer you can get to the metal in the more declarative you can be as a developer, the easier it is. So like if you can do something in HTML, do it in HTML and then add CSS to create styles and the look and feel that you want. And if you can do something in CSS, like an animation, then do it in CSS. But if you want to do something that can't be done in HTML or can't be done in CSS, then do it in JavaScript. That's cool. Use JavaScript. You know, there's a lot of like, well, hey, everybody's doing this in JavaScript, but do you really want to implement that same thing for the 400th time in your career as a developer? Like, can't we add that to HTML and put it in HTML? Like the switch control is now being added to HTML. Or, oh, we've been doing this, you know, people have been using JavaScript to do this, but is there a way to actually do that in CSS? Can we move it closer so that developers don't have to do as much work and it's baked more into the browser and it can be more accessible and more robust? And um, so I think that's where, like, the all of the people who make the web become what it is it's been that the work that all of those folks are doing has matured over time and sort of lessons learned over time become canon and then you can build on top of that canon and build you know just get some things going so yeah you don't have to do this now there's a new thing oh it's cooler oh it's more polished we got the basics for typography. Now we're getting a lot more polish for typography. We had the basics for layout. Now we're getting even more layout tools. We had the, you know, so it is, it's exciting. Um, I think the challenge for developers now is keeping up, right? How do you, wow, there's more new stuff I got to learn. How do I keep up? Um, but it's worth the investment of time. It will save you time in the long time if you, if you really, if you really learn it. Yeah. That's a question I get asked a lot is how do I keep up with the pace of everything coming out? I'm like, oh, I'm, I'm in a privileged place where I can actually spend time to do that for most of my day. And I understand if you're working, it can be a lot more challenging. Yeah. But I think just keeping an ear to the ground a little bit, at least so you know what's possible, I think is the most important thing. Yeah, I think that's a good strategy is if you at least just hear that something exists and you tuck that information in the back of your mind then the day that you're like, oh, I have to do a thing like that, maybe it would be faster to go learn the new one rather than use the longer, more laborious, old school way of doing it. So circling back a little bit to the, the pace of change um, that we sort of got to now, I think, at least from my own perception, uh, one of the things that it felt like for a while was Safari was a little bit slower in keeping up with some of the new features. Um, and that sort of changed a while back um, because, you know, I think Chrome and Firefox for a long time were on more of like the evergreen type of update schedule. And I think it was only in 2001 that Safari sort of officially made it like a switch into something where there was more uh, regular updates. I'm just curious about why it happened um, and and if it has helped in keeping up with all these new things that are coming out. Yeah, well, what happened in 2021 was that we changed the way that we number Safari. So rather than numbering it 10, 10.1, 11, 11.1, 12, 12.1, 13, 13.1, 14, 14 14.1, like there was more than one release in all of those years. We, we changed up the way that things are numbered. So Safari 15.0, 0.1, 0.2, 0.3, 0.4, 0.5, 0.6, 0.7, 0.8, 0.9, 0.10, 0.11, 0.12, 0.13, 0.14, 0.15, 0.16, 0.17, 0.18, 0
we took those lists very seriously and we started executing on them and, you know, things always take time. So it took time. Um, but starting Safari 15.4, there were quite a few features there. Safari 16.0, 16.2, 16.4, there was a ton of stuff in 2023 from like 16.4 to 17.2. We shipped like a record number of features. Um, Safari 17.2 just came out in December a couple weeks ago, and um, it was the biggest release that we've ever had in December. We were able, we just shipped more stuff spread around the year so that it gets into the hands of your users just a little bit sooner. I mean, I'm really happy to hear that people are seeing a difference, that it feels different because that was definitely our intention. Um, also, you know, there was a lot of uh, effort has my colleague and I, John Davis and myself, we put a lot of effort into writing a giant article. Also, a lot of WebKit engineers help with these articles. They're so huge. Like writing a really great article about each release where we go through all of the features that are in that release, not just the highlights or the most exciting things, but we talk about every single solitary new feature, no matter how obscure it is. And we take some time to describe it so that, like I said before, maybe you don't need it right away. Maybe it's part of the stack that you don't actually even write very often. But if you could at least learn what it is, then you can tuck it back in the back of your mind and when you do need it or when a colleague needs it or somebody else on your team needs it, you can be like, oh, I think I heard about something that shipped in Safari last year. Like, let's go check that out. And then there's links to let go actually learn how to use it. Um, but that's the hope with those articles. So I really, it's webkit.org is the website where we publish every time seven releases a year of Safari. So seven times a year that these giant articles that describe every single thing that's in the release. Um, and then also we're taking a lot of time to document and list in the release notes, because there's also release notes. So the articles go on webkit.org. There are release notes published on developer.apple.com, um, which if you just search for, you know, Safari 17.2 release notes, you'll find them. Um, but the we list all the bug fixes, like all of the bug fixes. But we, that was something else that we really heard from everybody is that folks wanted to, you know, you, you encounter a bug in the browser, maybe you filed the bug report and you're wondering what's going on. Um, and I think maybe sometimes what would happen is the bug would get fixed, but it wasn't really announced that it had been fixed. So folks sort of just assumed that it still hadn't been fixed, but it was fixed. So like that's this weird position to be in as a developer. So our goal is to like really list every single bug fix that affects web developers, which is so much work. It's so much work to go track them all down, but it, it matters. It, we're hearing from people that it really has been helpful. So that's what we're doing these days. So, yeah. Yeah, and actually, just on that note of, of the idea of filing bug reports, yeah. um, I just I do think it is worth mentioning that if somebody comes across a bug, that usually it's a good idea to file a bug report um, instead of just complaining about it on social media. <laughs> yeah, because you go to bugs.webkit.org, and that's where you can file. You know, it's a open source, open piece of software. You make on yourself an account and log in and file a bug report. Um, because those do go into our system where everything is being considered. Um, and I know often there's not a lot, I mean, we're working really hard over here and going very fast and folks don't always take a lot of time to update those tickets and explain what's happening, but it doesn't mean nothing is happening. It really does not mean that nothing is happening. There's there are many things happening over in another space. Um, so, and we're working on, like that's a place for an improvement. Like, oh, maybe we should figure out ways to help communicate outwards on those issues a little bit better. That might be nice. Um, but don't assume that if it's quiet, that means nothing's happening because we care a lot, a lot, a lot. I mean, often, you know, I made websites for decades. Most of the time when something was broken, it was me. I was, I was writing bad code. <laughs> but there are times where people realize, no, it's not me. Like I'm really, I really worked hard to figure out that there's something wrong with the browser please let us know. Please let us know because we want to fix it for sure. You're helping us out by letting us know if you find something that's wrong in our implementation. It matters, you know. It, these systems are massive. There's millions of lines of code in each web browser. So, And the code bases are, you know, 10, 20, 30, well, 20, 25 years old. So, yeah, it takes everybody to help track down anything that might be wrong and get it fixed.
Yeah, yeah I can imagine it's an overwhelming project at times. <laughs> I wouldn't want to have to deal with that side of things. I'm glad I just get to use the browsers <laughs> and not figure out how they work. <laughs> since we we're sort of on the topic of Safari and the update schedules and all of mm. that um, and sort of perceptions of it. I know for me, my early perceptions of it at one point were that it sort of went to the beat of its own drum um, in terms of what it was prioritizing. Uh, and a lot of it was like color related stuff or design related mm. stuff with typography things. Um, I think it's still the only browser that supports hanging punctuation, which yeah. I love. And I'm just like, oh, I wish that was everywhere because it's, it's nicer. Uh, there was initial letter. It had early support for the P3 colors um, for a long time now yeah. uh, and the color function and stuff. And it's sort of like that seemed like, you know, they were doing that and the other browsers were doing other stuff um, mm. more. And, you know, sort of that perception change that I was talking a little bit about was also when all of a sudden, I think it was a, a lot of the 2022 releases, especially when all of a sudden it was like the major features that everyone wanted. Safari was the first one to actually mm -hmm. launch them. Yeah. Uh, the two the two main ones that come to mind for me are has and container queries. Mm -hmm. uh, and I remember seeing like, it was probably a tweet from you or something um, on social media where it was like, these are coming now. And it, you know, and it was Safari, the first one I was like, whoa, okay, <laughs> that's, that's great. Uh, um, especially for such like massive features like that. Um, it's sort of, I guess for that's when I sort of really picked up that like, oh, things are going a little bit different over there right now. Um, mm -hmm. At least in my mind, in my own perception of it. Yeah, nesting came early enough uh, yeah. Subgrid um, obviously was way behind on Firefox, but <laughs> it was still ahead of Chrome. So yeah, I guess like on that on that front is has there either has there been a shift in what features or types of features you guys are looking at, or is it more of what you said about li just listening to what people are wanting, uh, or just like I guess how do you pick what new features you know this is what we're prioritizing now. Yeah, I mean it's always so complicated, right? Like how does any engineering team handle their backlog and figure out what to do next. I guess that's why I have product managers have jobs in some companies, <laughs> right? Um, and I think that uh, in some ways, Safari has always been super inventive and been pushing the boundaries on a lot of things. And I think, you know, w once I joined Apple, I was often surprised to learn stories about things that Apple had been taking the lead on that I had no idea. Somehow I had an impression that it was a different browser. And maybe that's more of a comparing DevRel team to DevRel team or something more than, or how much time or effort companies put into DevRel, I don't know. But rather than actual truth about who invented what. Um, but. You know, like, it's people at Apple who wrote the HTML5 design principles. It's people at Apple who came up with private browsing and shipped the first browser that had a private browsing mode. It's people at Apple who decided that we needed to eliminate third-party cookies years ago. Privacy, especially, taking the lead over and over again. Um, battery life, thinking about performance, not just as how fast does the browser page load, but, like, how much electricity does it use? That what do everyday people want? They want their batteries to last. They want to get online and surf the web forever on a device that has a battery and not have the battery die. So there's actually a developer tool in Web Inspector in Safari that shows you how much electricity something is using. And it's been there for years, right? So there, there are these ways where the folks behind Safari have been helping collaborating with everybody else to invent the web and drive the direction of the web, just like so many different companies, many of which you know the big names of because they own, they run browser projects, but also there are a lot of companies that you might not realize are super involved, like Adobe. Adobe's had huge impact on the web. Um, many, many, many different companies that I should, there's just too many to list. Um, so it's like a big group project that's actually quite successful. And so, yeah, recently I think there has been more ad effort to put into making sure that people know the things that we've been first on, that, that they aren't sort of sliding in secretly or s silently. They're not sliding in si silently, but they're, they're you know, we're, we're talking about them, we're writing about them more. And uh, I also think that in general, like I was talking about the maturity of the web and the way that people who make the web work together has evolved over time. And I think some of what you're seeing, like grid shipping, 
in four browsers in four weeks was so profound for so many people that I think there's been efforts across many different teams to say, hey, we should do that again. So things like cascade layers or nesting or whatever to be like, oh, oh, I see you over there working on that. We're going to work on that too. Or, oh, I, I talked to you about that. I'm not just going to think, eh, it will ship eventually. I'll think, wait, are you actually working on it? We want to work on it. Oh, we got to hurry up over here. So there's a lot of, I see every company doing a lot of that kind of work. Um, kind of naturally, like without necessarily having infrastructure around it, just sort of realizing that it's just super helpful and kind of fun when we all release sort of simultaneously. It, it starts to, people start to rewrite history and sort of make up these stories about it's been a, some kind of a competition and in a way it's really more of a giant collaboration. And I think it's important to realize the strength and the importance of all of the different teams, all the, the different companies that are involved and creating the web and moving the web forward and realizing that really helping any of those companies and making any of those companies stronger is helping the web in general. Um, that it's not a win one winner and everybody else is a loser, right? Like we really need everything to be working, every, every browser to be in great shape. So, yeah. With sort of what you said there about Grid, I remember for me, that was like a, like you said, it was like, wow, that just happened on all the browsers. Uh, okay. Yeah. I didn't know that was possible, um, especially yeah. after, you know, the pain of Flexbox taking years to seem to standardize. And then even once the spec was there, it seemed to take a long time to get to a place where all the browsers were, had it and implementing it in the same way. It was, it was a buggy mess for a little while. Um, so Grid was really exciting on that front. Um, and I... I when I saw all, like going back a few years, when we had all these new features that were sort of, people were talking about them and you'd hear chatter about, you know, whether it was container queries or, or other things, I was sort of like, wow, there's a lot of stuff coming. And I was a little bit worried that there'd be sort of a new fragmentation <laughs> going on uh, just because there was so much. And it's like, well, what if Safari prioritizes this and Firefox does that and Chrome does this other thing? Uh, and I think I was a little bit scarred by subgrid <laughs> when Firefox mm -hmm. jumped on that right away, and then it was like, oh, no one else is no one else is touching this. Okay, I, for a feature I was really excited by, <laughs> and um, yeah. luckily, luckily we finally got there. Um, but it seems like you said with nesting, with layers, uh, mm -hmm. there's so many others that it just has container queries, all these new features that are not only super useful but also really complex, and they're just coming out in all the browsers within a few months of each other. Um, we've mentioned it a little bit, you know, you, you talked a little bit about why that might be happening. Um, and you've also mentioned the interop a few times now. Yeah, well, let's talk about interop. But actually, I just you just reminded me of another yeah. thing that changed that I think really is the reason that it seems different because it is different. But this is it's this is what changed. So back in the day, uh, for a while, if something new came along, like border radius, the working group would think of the idea, they would write it down, they would discuss the details, and then somebody would implement it and ship it and it would be out there in the world. But then something like Flexbox was far more complicated and it actually needed some implementation experience where you couldn't just imagine it in your head and write it down and be like, that sounds good, we're done. It was like, oh, we need to actually have some running code. We need to actually see what this feels like. We need to make some demos and see if those demos work out well. And in order to do that, everything was put behind a prefix. Um, and also there were other times when browsers would be like, oh, we have an idea for something. That's why there are so many WebKit prefixes because Apple, there was lots of engineers at Apple who were like, oh, there's a really good idea. Let's go ahead and try this out. But we don't have a web standard for it yet. So let's just put it behind a prefix while we're coming up with this idea and implementing it and figuring out the details. Once the web standard is done, then we can take the prefix off, right? So that was kind of the way that things worked for a really long time. And Flexbox was in some ways the pinnacle of realizing that that's, that can go wrong <laughs> when things are complicated because there were literally three entirely different ideas about how Flexbox should work. And all three of them were shipped into browsers behind prefixes. And so there was like the 20, whatever, 12 version, or I guess it was like the 2006 version that shipped behind a prefix. And then there was the 2009 or something like that version got shipped 
uh, and so browsers just kind of wiped out their first implementation and wrote their second implementation. And I think the intention on the part of the people who were making browsers, although I'm not totally sure because I didn't work for a browser at that point personally, but I think the sense among the engineers was like, well, nobody's using this yet. This is a rough draft. Um, and But it, those of us who were front-end developers were like, awesome, I'm using this right now. <laughs> Right. Like I read the books about CSS three that showed you how to use a WebKit, you know, a prefix, a whatever flavor of prefix. And so I was writing all kinds of code and shipping it into production with prefixes. But then it would get changed, and then your website would change from out from underneath you. Or so after all of that experience, having Flexbox be so painful, having developers end up feeling very skeptical and like I can't trust what's going on. And then, for instance, when Grid came along, people were like, I'm not touching Grid for the first four years. I'm going to wait until 2021 when it's been out for a while because I don't trust, I don't want to go through what I just went through with Flexbox. But it's like browsers change the way we do things, right? So there are no more new prefixes. There are no more rough drafts being shipped to everyday people in the normal browsers that they use. Everything is behind a flag, so the advantage to that is that when a new idea comes along and it needs some work and some implementation experience, like Grid, so this started when Grid was still under construction. This started in 2012, where Grid was put into browsers, well, not 2012, but like 2015 or so. Grid was being put into browsers without a prefix behind a flag. Um, and so Grid was worked on and changed radically many, many, many times behind a flag Developers were not really paying attention. And then when it did ship in 2017, all everybody, all the browsers had to actually do was just flip the flag. They're just turning it on. Um, and it had already been, you know, baking for five years. So at this point, when things are being created, they're being created behind a flag. And they don't ship until they're ready. It may feel like things are showing up quickly, but actually there was years of work behind it or it may feel like things are showing up like many many things but it's it's even more work than you might even realize is happening it's just much neater and much more everything's like ready once you once it gets to a place where it's shipping without the flag um so developers should feel much more confident about using those things quickly especially if it's something that will work with progressive enhancement, that you can use a progressive enhancement technique, then start using it right away um, because it's not going to change from out underneath you. It's, it's the, the web standard is stable. It's ready to go. And that's a pretty massive difference between how things used to be and how they are, they are now. No. Yeah. I, I, like you said, I think the, the flag system works so much better than the prefix one did. Where ever, cause, oh, like you said, oh, this is there. I can use a prefix and put it in. And going through prefix hell we had for a few years <laughs> with all the different stuff. It's a, a world that any developer who didn't have to live through that, I'm, they're jealous yeah. that they didn't have to deal with all that. Yeah, you made me think there a little bit of just with, with talking about progressive enhancements. Is I, At one point, because um, I've, I've always had the whole... Thing of whenever I put out a video on a topic, someone will invariably say, what about browser support if it's below right. even a really high number? Um, I used to do early on with Grid. I, like I, I, I was looking through my videos recently and I had like a bunch of Grid videos and then I actually had a, a, a gap for a while just because like you said, there were so many people just like browser support, browser support, browser support. And I'm like, mm -hmm. okay, I'm going to take a little break. And once support numbers are, are higher, I, I guess I went back to it. I don't know. It, it wasn't necessarily a conscious decision. I'm not sure. But mm -hmm. um, one thing, at one point I sort of decided that I wasn't going to do a video unless at least two browsers supported a feature mm -hmm. um, just to sort of for whatever to say, at least I know this is coming, this is good, two browsers are do it, but now there's a, a few things I've done where it's like, well, only one browser might support this, or it's even, well, yeah, generally, uh, but it's just a progressive enhancement, you know, mm -hmm. so it's a really cool thing, it mm -hmm. works if they have that browser that's supporting it, and if not, it doesn't really matter, it doesn't break anything, everything's fine, it's just people get a cooler or more fun or whatever it is, but like, more people need to sort of lean into that mentality a little bit. I think it's one of the most important skills to really understand as a web developer is what is progressive enhancement and how do you do it. And if you're writing CSS to really understand the difference between, I don't know, something like cascade layers or nesting, the benefit is for the developer to make 
it easier to write code, it doesn't really make a difference to the user, right? Like user can't tell that you nested your CSS or that you used cascade layers in your CSS. Um, so maybe those things you don't want to use until basically all your users have support because you would have to write your code twice and once for using these layers and once not using these layers. And that makes your life harder, right? Like if the whole point is to make your life easier than like why bother? Except I should say, I bet there are some great third-party tools that do pre-processing or something that could help you through that transition. So in those, those might actually be a good idea. I don't, I haven't actually looked at them, so I don't, I can't recommend them or not recommend them either way. But if you just think about if for some reason you couldn't use any third-party tools and you had to only write vanilla CSS, um, would you want to use ca cascade layers and like a change to the cascade if you don't have any support, you know, if you, maybe, I don't know, 40% of your users have support, it might be too early. But there are other things where something like, um, like line height units are one of my new favorites, where you can easily define your line height using a rem or an m or whatever, and then very quickly write it again and be like, well, if you don't know what an LH unit is, then you're going to use 1.2 rems. But if you do know what an LH unit is, then you're going to use one RLH super easy to do progressive enhancements like that. Super easy to make sure that all of the browsers are covered, even if somebody's got a very old device with a very old browser over in the corner, that they're good too. Their their content's going to look awesome. And, um, and yet you can use these things now and make your website look extra gorgeous now, not have to wait five years or something. Um, because even when 98% of your users have support for something, those 2% of people matter. They can, on a big project, they can actually be a lot of people. So progressive enhancement is a good way to ensure that all of your users are going to have a good experience, even if it's only four people who have who don't have support or something, that those four people matter too, right? So, And that the web is designed to do that. Like the whole reason that the web was invented and the web became the dominant way that people use the internet is because baked right into the basic idea, the basic technological architecture of the web is, hey, this is gonna work on a bunch of different devices, a bunch of different computers. Computers that back in the 80s, like literally had no way to talk to each other. The web worked the same, or not the same, but the web worked on all of them and different people would have different experiences but they all could have an experience of the web that worked. And so those are really important values to have and very important techniques to understand how to do. And they're not that hard. Like it's a little bit weird if you're, I don't know if you came from a computer science background or something where maybe in other coding environments, it's very bifurcated where it's like, you need support for operating system number, whatever. And if you have it, you can download my app. And if you don't, you do not get to use my app. Like then you can count on there only being a certain kind of support because you've it's very locked down where the web is the web's supposed to run everywhere on very very different machines so cool lean into it like that's what's fun about it um yeah so anyway progressive enhancement you could talk about it forever but it, i see new you know new people all the time learning and and i am like oh you've got to this is like one of the most important skills you have to learn is what is what in the world is progressive enhancement and how do you do it? Yeah. Yeah. Circling back, circling back to interrupt, um, yeah. just the idea there of, of all the browsers or not all the browsers, but just sort of the, I guess, seeing this, everyone sort of moving in the same direction a little bit. Uh, and we'd mentioned, or you'd mentioned interrupt a couple of times now, just mm. for people who aren't familiar with it. Could you sort of give a little bit of background? Yeah. So the, if you're wondering how, you know, oh, this web technology doesn't work the way I think it's supposed to. Well, the supposed to, what does that mean? How is it supposed to work? Well, any web technology, the way it's supposed to work is according to the web standard, right? So there's a web standard someplace that's been written down, a technical document that explains exactly how that web technology is supposed to work. It's not like the first browser that shipped it is right and everybody else is supposed to copy. It's that there's a document somewhere that's been written down by a working group. Um, and so you can test, you can write automated tests to see, hey, Cascade Layers, is it behaving the way it's supposed to be behaving? Well, let's write a whole bunch of automated tests. That way also over time, engineers can keep an eye and make sure that nobody created a regression bug that that feature mm -hmm. keeps working the way it's supposed to be working. Um, and so there are repositories of shared open source tests of web platform technologies. One of them is called web platform tests. 
which tests a lot of like CSS and JavaScript. And now actually new accessibility tests have been written. And not, not, I'm sorry, not JavaScript, CSS and HTML. There's a separate set of tests for JavaScript someplace else. So that project, there's a project called WPT, Web Platform Tests. So there's a, a project that that organization started hosting several years ago that's called Interop. Interop 2023, maybe you heard of. There's an Interop 2022 and Interop 2024 coming up. Um, where each year there are a, there's a group of organizations that get together to decide what's going to be an interrupt next year. So, and it, the last three years that it's been the same group. So there's six of us: Apple, Google, Mozilla, Microsoft. So those are oh yeah, Chrome, Edge, Safari, and um, Firefox. Uh, also, Boku and Galia both of which are companies that have a whole bunch of browser engineers that work on many of these browsers. Like Agalia works, does a lot of work on WebKit. So it's all a bunch of, you know, six companies of browser engineers who come together to say, okay, I mean, in a perfect world with an infinite number of people working on our these browser engines, we would fix everything and there would be no bugs <laughs> and we would implement everything. But no team has that many people on them. So... Uh, priorities, like what could we choose of all of the things that are making it hard to build websites, especially like what is something that's just not behaving the way it's supposed to be, especially maybe some of the stuff that got written up in web standards 10 years ago, 20 years ago, maybe things that were shipped in CSS2 or CSS3 that didn't have interoperability, where it worked a little different in each of the browsers. And there are things, you know, in CSS where you start to think about it, you're like, oh, that's right, there is that cool feature, like how to make a border out of a bunch of different images that have all been chopped up so that you can put a picture frame around every image or something. Like, that's right, I did try to use that once, and it was so hard, and it didn't seem to work, and so I stopped using it, and I never tried again. Like. Well, maybe the reason it was hard is because maybe it wasn't implemented correctly in all the browsers. So, oh, so this year, for instance, in Interop 2023, that was one of the focus areas was border image. Like, let's let's fix whatever bugs are there. Let's fix whatever differences are that are there between browsers. Um, and sometimes things that are chosen for Interop or some of the newer things, like Cascade Layers was in Interop, the idea being that, like, hey, this is going to be... It looks like this is something we're already all working on. The spec... The, the, the web standard is done, right? So this is not a place to come up with new ideas. This is not a place to finish web standards. You're like, you'll see that nesting was not part of Interop 2023 because the nesting specification was still being debated, it still had not been decided how it was going to work. So it couldn't be part of Interop. Interop is about things that have already been, there's already consensus, the web standard is already finished, everybody already knows what it's supposed to be. There are already tests that have been written, right? So if there's no tests, even if it's a good idea, it can't be an Interop either. Like it has to have tests. So let's like use the tests and double check and has, for instance, was in there just to like, is there any, are there any differences? Are there any bugs? Um, and at this point has, it's passing 100% of the tests in all of the major browsers. And Interop is only testing desktop browsers because of the infrastructure at WPT. And it's actually only testing them on older operating systems, right? Like, so it's not a perfect situation, but it's, it's pretty good. And what it does is it gets the attention of all of our teams in these six companies and sort of says, hmm, yeah, you know, pointer and mouse events. Like, let's, yeah, let's all commit to making this better. Let's all commit this year to sitting down and figuring out. Actually, two years ago, there was an investigation project, which is basically homework for the team that runs Interop. So two years ago, people wanted to do pointer or mouse events, but there was no consensus on what it should be, and there were no tests and whatever. Or, or I shouldn't say no tests, but there, there was a need for better test coverage. So the group spent a year looking at the specs and figuring out what was agreed on and figuring out what those tests could be. And they spent the year writing tests. And then that was for 2022. And then in 2023, that became the focus area where those tests started counting towards this. Basically, basically all it is is a scoreboard. <laughs> it's a dashboard where there's a big score for each of the browser engines. And you can look and see um, every time a new browser engine or a new... 
preview browser comes out, a new version of Safari Technology Preview or a new version of Chrome Dev or a new version of Firefox, Firefox Nightly, the tests get run again and you can see the score and you can kind of track it. There's a little graph that shows you like the improvement over the year. Um, and there's a column that shows like, okay, let's not just look at browser versus browser. Let's look at which tests pass everywhere. Like at the beginning of the year, I think it was like 48% of all of the tests that had been selected to be part of Interrupt passed in all the engines, 48%. And now I think it's 95%. 95% of all the tests pass in all the engines. And there's an open call each fall. So if you are this year a developer working on some code and there's a thing you'd like to use, but in that he- back in your head, you get that feeling of like, oh, this is just so crappy. I wish it worked everywhere, but it doesn't. Take a note and next fall, go, it's over, like it's an open call on GitHub. You just make a GitHub issue on the right repository and uh, file an issue. And you gotta make a case, you gotta like submit an application with like all the information. Where are, are there tests? Where are they? What, is there a spec? Where is it? Um, what seems to be the problem? What What's the idea here? I think we had 91 proposals for focus areas for 2024. I can tell you that we're not going to pick 91. <laughs> That's a lot, <laughs> it's, yeah. It's too many. It's too many. So, you know, we'll pick whatever handful of, yeah. of things that seem to really stand out. Um, yeah. So yeah. there, obviously, you know, developers can have an influence on that by, by submitting things. Um, you'd mentioned earlier that people sometimes, you know, just Safari sort of heard through blog posts and social media at one point and made some decisions to go forward based on the feedback they were hearing there. I'm mm-hmm. curious if you have, like, if people say there's a feature that's maybe in the works but doesn't seem like hanging indentation. I want I want that mm-hmm. to be in Chrome and, and Firefox, let's say, but uh, maybe there's something that's not in Safari yet or whatever it is. Like, as a user that would like to see it, and it's something that exists, but it just doesn't seem to be you know, prioritized is, you know, how do, how do browsers hear from people? Is it just through, you know, watching social media or listening to social media and, and blog posts? Is there a way that, you know, we get our voices heard, I mm-hmm. guess, because it's hard when you're just, you know, I have an audience, but most people are, you don't have what I have. And I'm just curious, like for, for the people watching, if they have something that they'd like to see progress on that maybe isn't at the interrupt level yet, but is, you know, earlier on uh, in the spec or something, if there's something they can do. Yeah. I mean, any, any method of communication that you can possibly think of, whether you're trying to communicate with browser teams or working groups who write the web standards or other developers or other designers, um, you know, any of those ways of connecting with people work. Uh, it really is about reaching out to regular humans and talking to them. Um, but also, I do think that before I started working on browsers, I would have had no idea how effective a really well-written blog post can be. Where, for example, I saw someone else, I think the other day, write about hanging punctuation, that they really love it, they like using it. Um, If you write something and you teach, because of course there's many people who have no idea it exists, so like, teach it. Say, here it is, it works like this. I love using it in this situation. Here's the code, here's an example. I just, you never heard of it, I just taught you how to use it. Also, what's the progressive enhancement story there? Like, that's a perfect example of, it. that's great. You can hang your punctuation for the browsers that support mm-hmm. it, and then your quotation marks will be inside the paragraph for the browsers that don't support it. So, like, tell that story too, right? And um, if you can start to create a conversation, even if that conversation is nowhere near any of the people who have, a ch- have the opportunity to make decisions or impact roadmaps for browsers or whatever, um, and it, it, those things can just, it, there's just a, there's a remarkable way in which those conversations can start to build. And especially if your example is gorgeous, your web page is really um, cool, then people are like, wow, that's a gorgeous example. That's beautiful. And then they want to tell each other and then they share it with each other on social media or private channels or wherever. Um, sometimes it doesn't take very much for that to, to then show up in front of someone who works for a browser company or someone who works in a working group. Um, Because I can tell you that there are many times when, because especially there are many conversations that are happening across companies in 
working groups or in organizations like the interop organization where there's just coming, you know, we all kind of like many of the people that who work in these places know each other and are talking about stuff all the time. And, um, and people just point it out to each other and be like, wow, look at this. Oh yeah. I've been meaning for years to do something about hanging punctuation at my company. That's right. Not only do I want that, I also want this other thing that goes with it. We should fix widows and orphans. Okay, cool. Let's, we talked about that three years ago. We also talked about it eight years ago. We talked about it 15 years ago, but we never did solve that problem. Did we? Oh, people still want it. People still want this solved. Good to hear from them. I wasn't sure whether they still wanted it. We mm-hmm. all thought 20 years ago this would be awesome. It sounds like people still want it. Good to know. That will help me decide what to focus on as I'm working next year. Um, yeah, it does really make a big difference. Yeah. And I think <laughs> stories and, and like friendliness go a really long way. Right, um, yeah. 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 Speaking of one of those blog articles, one that caught my attention years ago was one on uh, margin trim. Um, I think it was on a medium post. It was really good. It had like the visuals that would go across to animate it to sort of show you how it's working and stuff. It was really well done. And it was like, oh, that's going to be fantastic. I'm really looking forward to it. Uh, and then it, I, th- I think actually it's now shipped in Safari. So, yep. <laughs> um, yep. but it seemed to take a long time. Like at one point I thought mm-hmm. it just, I'm like, oh, I guess it's not happening. Cause this has been a long time. And it's funny cause sometimes you hear about something and it's like super early, it's being proposed, they're talking about it. And then all of a sudden it just gains momentum and it ships. And then other times like with margin trim, mm-hmm. uh, it seems to take a really long time. Um, and I'm curious and with, there was margin trim and I think it was letting trim were like sort of Mm -hmm. bundled together in the thought process there, which I don't think is shipped with the margin trim. So I'm just curious why some things can seem to build momentum, go really fast or other times it seems to take, I think it must be at least four years or three years at least since I read that post. So it feels like it was that long anyway. (laughs) Um, yeah, it's, it is always complicated. It's always like a story of humans. Um, so let's talk a little bit, because also I'd love to teach people about some new technology, right? So margin trim, and yeah, what used to be called letting trim, but is now called text box trim and text box edge. Um, they're awesome. These are things that there's a bunch of smaller little pieces that if you start to add them up and put them together, we're inching our way towards vertical rhythm and being able to do vertical rhythm on the web and be able to being able to polish typography in a, uh, to a level that hasn't been possible before. So if you have a paragraph, like let's say you have a card and inside of that card you've got a headline and you've got a whole bunch of paragraphs and you've put padding on the card so that that text is standing away from the edge. Sometimes the first content that's in that card is a par- is a headline and the headline does have a top margin. Or what about the bottom? Like maybe there's all sorts of different things that could be the last thing. Maybe sometimes it's a little bit of a, a tiny menu or something and those menus don't have top and bottom margin on them. But other times it's a paragraph and those bottom paragraphs, the, po- the paragraphs have bottom margin on them, right? So what ends up happening is that margin gets added to the padding easily get from your QA team where they're like, why is there extra space here? This looks weird. And you're like, oh, because somebody put different content in this card and we didn't write the code for that. A better way to do it is to re- is to not try to remove the margins from all the content on the inside the card, but to instead say, hey, card, I'm putting some padding on you. And I also want you to now magically know that you should chop all the margins off of anything that's touching you. <laughs> So it doesn't matter what it is. If it's going to butt up against you, I just want you to chop the margin off. Um, m- margin trim. So it's very simple, but it means that you can kind of address this situation in a much more robust fashion. Um, and then letting trim is, or really text box trim now, is going to be a way for you to be able... Oh, by the way, margin trim shipped in Safari already, so it's already out in the world. I haven't looked recently to see on Kenny use what what's up with other browsers, but there's, there's a place. If you want this, you could start talking about how it would actually be very useful to you um, so that uh, you know folks understand how important it is and whether they should rank it ahead or behind other things that they could be working on. Um, Letting trim is not shipped in browsers yet, and it's not shipped because the spec isn't finished. So margin trim and letting trim, I think, I think, I think they were sort of 
thought of together in the CSS working group and the web standards were written around the same time and it felt like letting trim was just as mature and was going along just as happy as margin trim and that those things could kind of shift at the same time. I think that maybe we started implementing them around the same time-ish. Um, but as we were implementing and we were continuing discussions with the CSS working group, it became apparent that, oh, letting trim actually starts to touch upon a different problem that's been involved on the web for a really long time, which is this. So if you've ever, say, typeset a paragraph and there are multiple languages in that paragraph or other characters of some kind, and your font, your main font doesn't support those characters or doesn't support that other language, the characters in that other language, then it will fall back to a different font, right? So maybe you've got your fancy brand web font as your main font, but it doesn't have a certain, like a C with a certain thing hanging down or a U with a certain thing above it, or, or there's characters in another language, a, a CJK language or another language. So it like switches fonts. That other font, and just for a little bit, like maybe only one letter is in a different font or one word is in a different font. Um, that other font could have different metrics to it. And the X height for that other font, for example, could be bigger. Or like the font is all set to the same rem, like maybe it's all 1.2 rem, but visually that fallback font looks bigger, which by the way, we should talk about this with font size adjust too, because it's a similar problem. Font size adjust fixes part of what's going on, but what ends up happening with the original line box, the way it lays out on the web, is the one of the major principles of the web is that if there's a choice between cutting content off, like making it disappear, or making it appear but be ugly, you go with making it appear and be ugly, <laughs> right? Don't chop content off. Just move stuff around so that everything is visible. That's how the web works. It's a very important principle. It's, it's the right choice. It's a good principle. But what that meant is that the original line box model is, is set up so that if the line height for that fallback font is, for example, bigger, then like that one line will be, there'll be like more space above and below that one line. And it also happens with things like footnote numbers, like superscripts, yep. where you, like superscripts sound like such a good idea and you add one in and you've got like this beautiful paragraph with this whole giant article and every line of text is the same distance from every other line of text, just like it should be. And then there's like a little tiny number two hanging up in the air. And then all of a sudden that line has more space above and below it. And you're like, why? <laughs> Don't do that, right? So that line box model, I, I, it's very complicated, and I especially can't explain it with only using words, but complicated things are happening behind the scenes in an attempt to make sure that no content ever gets cut off. But there's new ideas about how that same problem might get solved instead, and a different line box model could keep it from getting that weird raggedy thing where suddenly there's more or less space because the font changed or because there's a superscript or because something else is going on or subscript. And in some ways that re it reminds me of box sizing and, you know, box sizing border box versus box sizing content box. So box sizing content box was the default in most browsers except for one browser. It turns out box sizing border box is actually a better default. So most people in their reset styles, just right off the bat, you just apply box sizing border box to everything. So I think, I think we might land in a place where text box edge gives us a new, gives us a way to switch to a different line box model and that we're going to maybe, maybe do a similar thing and be like, yeah, text box edge foobar just like everywhere, could you please use the better line box model? But I say if, and I'm not sure, and maybe because this is this is all still getting worked out. Like this part of the spec hasn't been written yet. So there's like a theory that hey, maybe we could and maybe we could like wander over into this other space and fix some things over here. And maybe what we should do is have text box trim gives you the ability to trim off some space, which I haven't described yet, which I can describe in a minute. But text box edge would give you a chance to switch line box models. 
And also switching to line box models will give you the opportunity to tell text box trim exactly where to trim. So it's like we started to get into the space of like, hey, let's just chop off extra white space on the line boxes. And we ended up with, oh, right. This is really complicated. Maybe we should revisit all of this with the wisdom of 2020s, the 2020s, rather than going with what I had to find in the 1990s. Um, but it takes time. Those conversations take time. And sometimes they take implementation experience. They also take, like, maybe somebody who works as an evangelist somewhere should write a blog post about this and come up with some demos and some examples and really start to explore whether or not the ideas that are in Safari Technology Preview or in other, you know, like in Rough Draft could, are working the way we intend them to work. Because again, sometimes the ideas in your head don't actually work out the way you think they're going to. Um, so it helps to like get it in a browser, make some demos, try it out. And this is where web designers and developers can help too, where you can, maybe you learn about something that's half built and you can write some code and see whether or not you like it and then write a blog post about how you loved it or how you hated it or how it kind of worked, how it didn't work the way you expected it to, how you kind of wish it was this other way. Like, people will see that and people will read it and people will discuss it and people will, it will be part of the conversation as decisions are being made. Um, especially, you know, again, if it's like well-intended and kind and yep. um, full of information, full of like real world, this is what it actually means to be a web designer and a web developer right now. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, but letting so letting trim and text box trim. It, letting trim is the old name. Text box trim is the, is the new name. But basically, what it's going to do is so. And this is the example I started to say before, but it was the wrong one. So let's imagine you have a paragraph with a headline, and above it you have an image, and it's certain viewport sizes or whatever. You float that image, and what you want is for the top of the headline to line up with the top of the image because it's just going to look nice. But the top of the ink on the letters, maybe you're writing in English and your, ted your headline has some capital letters on the words, but there's nothing else that sticks up any higher than your capital letters. You don't have any um, little extra characters or anything. But that capital M is not, the top of the capital M is not lining up with the top of the image. And you're like, why? Is there any margin? No. Is there any padding? No. Is there any, like, what? Is, why is there extra space there? What it is, is there's extra space inside, it's sort of inside, it sort of comes along with the font, where the font, you know, your capital M stops at a certain place, but maybe somebody else is writing a capital U, and they have a umlaut above the capital U, or they're writing a capital E with an accent mark on the top of the capital E, or they're writing in a language like Thai that has all sorts of parts, glyphs, parts of the characters that go higher than the cap height of a font. So fonts support multiple languages, and there's all sorts of different metrics for these other languages. So letting trim is basically going to come along and say, well, where do you want to cut it? Do you want to cut it at the cap height? Do you want to cut it at the X height? And it's not going to cut off ink. So if you say, I want it to cut off at the cap height, and then you do have an accent mark, the accent mark is still going to be there. It's just going to stick up above the line. In fact, it will be like higher than the image. And maybe that's what you want. Maybe you want the cap height to line up with the top of the E, and then you want the accent mark to be higher than either one of those things. Um, but another challenge with Textbox Edge is, oh, now we need to reach into the font Oh, also we need to say, okay, well, we know cap height is a number, is a metric that people might want to use. That's a good line. X height's another good one. Maybe you want to chop off at X height. Maybe you make it so there are no capital letters and you want to line something up along that X height. But what else? What's the right line to use in Thai? What's the right line to use in Korean? What's the right line to use in all of these many, many languages around the world? Also, people who make fonts aren't necessarily very consistent about filling out the tables of all the data that they're supposed to fill out. So let's go talk to the Unicode Consortium and see whether or not we need to get some new metrics added to the fonts. And let's talk to the people who make fonts and see if they're going to fill out the tables. And what are we going to do if they don't fill them out? And so it's a more complicated conversation than chopping off margins. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's definitely one of those like, <laughs> oh, this sounds like a great idea. Oh my goodness, it's <laughs> it is a good idea, but it's <laughs> there's a lot that goes into it. Yeah. 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 <laughs> but by the way, 
I mentioned cap, yes. cap height, X height. Um, there's some cool units that people should know about. Um, I like the cap unit. I like the X unit, EX for X. And now there's root units for those. So you can do R C A P for root cap height. And you can do R E X for root X height. Um, there's a character unit, which in horizontal writing modes, which is say, for example, how English works, how most languages around the world work is that they, you know, the, the string of text lays out horizontally. The CH unit measures the width of the zero character of the font. So it's like, Oh, instead of saying how many rem, why don't you say, I want my column to be 40 characters wide. I want my column to go from 25 characters wide to 40 characters wide. Minimum of 25 characters, maximum of 20 of 40 characters. Like, that's a great way to do typography. Mm -hmm. And if you want to do a root character unit, you can, there's now an RCH unit. Um, the IC unit, which stands for ideographic character, the I is ideographic and the C is character, IC. That is for measuring the width if it's horizontal or height if it's vertical of a CJK character. So a character in Chinese and Japanese and Korean or other languages that are similar that are character based. Um, in those languages, it tends to work. The way it tends to work is that all of the characters are the same size as each other, except for the ones that are not that size, like Ruby is smaller and some characters are half, half character width. But there's this idea, there's a concept in those, in those, in typesetting those languages where every character is the same width kind of like monospace fonts in in mm -hmm. in latin based text in latin based covers uh languages like english but the um but it's really important and in fact especially in japanese typography like lining things up even when you typeset horizontally you're like of course you everybody wants their lines to look gorgeous type horizontally but then because the characters are all the same width as each other you start to create this vertical alignment as well or of course you can japanese especially lay things out using a vertical writing mode so then it's like the other direction the horizontal direction so everything is kind of a square and you want all your squares to line up and be squares on the square grid so you could use say the round function and ask the browser to not make the width of the column be any pixel in between, but to be like always rounding off to the nearest character. So that as the as you make the browser, if you if you're doing responsive web design or whatever, and you make the browser width and the, your column gets wider, that it doesn't like smoothly open up. It like jumps for one character width to another to the next, or every ten characters to like jump to the next ten characters, or pixels. You could say, I want you to always round off to the nearest. 100 pixels, this flexible column. Um, anyway, these units just kind of like open up. They sound so simple. I mean, you read about them in release notes or whatever. You're like, oh, that's whatever. Okay. But I, I can't wait until people who care a lot about typography really think deeply about what they mean and start to realize, oh, instead of using a rem and m for everything, I think I'm going to be more prescriptive and say I want this to be a certain number of characters wide and I want this to be a certain number of this wide. I want this to be the same. I want my line height. I want my box to be this. I want my margin around my paragraph to be one line height so that the, whatever the line height is on my text, that the space between the two paragraphs is exactly one line height. You couldn't do that. You can now. Line height units new last year. Um, there's also root line height units, right? So there's, in some ways, it's like, oh, there's so many units. I don't know what to do with them all. But on the other hand, it's like, there's so many units. There's so many things you can do with them all. Um, typography, I just, it, it's never been like this before. Like the amount of gorgeousness that designers could ask for is amazing. And I wish they would rather than just saying everything's a pixel. Like nothing's a pixel. Everything is a is a unit based on something else on the page. Um, font size adjust. I feel like I'm just on a monologue. It's but. <laughs> great. No, I'm, I'm enjoying myself. <laughs> Keep going. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so font size adjust. It gets back to that problem I was describing before where different fonts are different sizes. So even if you say, I want everything to be 1.2 rem, it's going to be... So one place that this happens a lot is... If you're making a website and you're talking about code and you're like, oh, my normal font is this font, maybe Georgia, I'll just use old school fonts. Like my normal body copy is Georgia, but I want my code to be typeset in Courier. And then you're like, 
writing a sentence and then you say, you know, in the middle of the sentence, you say the word, you put, you switch to the code font and you say font size adjust and then you go back to the rest of the sentence. But the O in font in courier is like bigger than the O in the other word in Georgia. And you're sitting there looking at it going, really? <laughs> that looks weird. So then maybe you sit there with a developer tools and you're, you search for the magical number of like, well, if I make my code yeah. font be 82%, no, 81%, no, 83%, no, 82.5%, now they visually look the same, right? Mm-hmm. But what if you're not using Courier in Georgia? What if you're using web fonts? And then what if the web fonts don't download and it falls back to Courier? And you've got your body web font and you've got Courier when you actually you picked your magical number to be your gorgeous fancy code web font, right? Then it could end up being extra big. Also, computers are good at doing math. And this is a problem where, like, I feel like this is all of what CSS is doing. Like, yes, a developer can sit there and fuss with it to try to get it to be hopefully good if conditions are optimal. But what happens when conditions are not optimal, it ends up being not good. And also it takes a lot of work. How about instead we put this the burden of all, all of this on the browser? Get the browser to do this work. You don't want to do this work as a developer. And font size adjust was defined one way. It was implemented in Firefox that way, and it was in there for a really long time, and it worked just that way. And then people realized, people at the CSS working group, that they could make it better. And so they added two other parts to it. So I guess I'll describe how it was originally, and then I'll describe how it's better now, and actually how you should just use the better one. Um, but the original one was, okay, you're not going to look at the first font. You're just going to look at all the fonts in the paragraph, and you're going to look at the X height, and you're going to look at the font, the whole font itself. And you're, there's a, like a ratio between those two numbers. It's like X height divided by the font size or something. And I want you to change the size of the font so that the X height is whatever. So I think most fonts are around 50%. They're around 0.5. So you would say font font size adjust 0.5. And what that would do is it would iterate over every font in the paragraph and it would just adjust all the sizes. It would say, oh, 1.4 rem, but I need to adjust the ink so that the X height is half of 1.4 rem, sort of. Not really, but kind of. And then it would adjust all of the font sizes so that they were all, all the X heights would be like 1.5 of the whole thing. Mm -hmm. And so if you had your body copy and you had your code font, it would adjust both of them to be 1.5. There's a few problems with that. One is you're still searching for a magical number. Maybe you don't want to change your main body font, you just want to change the others. So what I would have done as a developer in those that era is like try to magical number. Well, what is the ratio of my main font? Oh, it's not 0.5. It's actually 0.475. And then I'll put 1.475 so that my main font isn't actually changed and all the other fonts are, are conformed to match by being 1.475, right? But that's a pain in the ass. So instead of finding a magical number, you can just use this newer thing, which is called from font. So you use the from font keyword and it will look at, as I was starting to describe before, it will look at the main font and it will say, huh, what's the ratio of this font? And then it will apply that font to everything. And then also, why would you only want to be able to do this to X height? Some languages don't even have an X height, right? Maybe you want to conform to a cap height or maybe you want to conform to some other measuring. So now you can, you, it's called two value syntax, but basically means you can say, either a number or from font, and then you can add a second value, and the second value can be which metric do you want it to be using. Mm-hmm. By default, it will use X height, but if you, don't, if you say something else, it will use the other thing that you've said, which gives this feature true internationalization support, which is what it should have. Mm-hmm. So Safari was the first browser to ship all three parts, which is really cool. Firefox has, sort of, has since caught up, and they implemented the newer parts. So now Firefox and Safari have full support for all of this stuff. Um, which is pretty great. And it means, and this is a a great example, a great example of progressive enhancement where use it today. And in a browser that doesn't have support, 
whether it's an older browser or a browser that hasn't implemented yet, sure, your, your code font will be a little bit bigger. But did you actually adjust it anyway? You probably, maybe most websites don't even adjust it. Um, or if you want to keep your little adjustment that you did old school by changing the font size or whatever, you can do that. Just keep it, wrap it up in a support statement where you say, add support, not font size adjust, colon from font space metric. And then if the browser doesn't understand that statement, then it will run your little, uh, you know, old school hacky code mm -hmm. um, to try to adjust the font. Um, so, and you can do that, you can do that today, even if 1% of your users have support, only 1%, which is more than that. But if, if for some reason, only 1% of users had support, you could ship that code today. And then over the next decade, as it becomes 100% of your users having support or five years or whatever it takes, um, more and more and more people would have the kind of extra polished, beautiful experience. But literally everybody can read the code and read the regular font. Everybody you know, everybody gets the thing they're actually kind of used to on the web where all of a sudden in the middle of the paragraph, the font changes and it's a different size. And everybody's like, well, it's just the web. That's how it works. It's like, well, yeah. So font size adjusts. It's cool. It's it's a little hard to explain, but um, once you start to understand what it's doing, it's like, oh, finally. Amazing. I've needed yeah. this forever. <laughs> um, yeah. And I explain these things. I explain font size adjust and margin trim and a whole bunch of stuff about color and some other things that were actually really hard to figure out how to explain in my session from WWDC last summer called What's New in CSS, um, which I highly suggest people check out because it's really, like there's a lot of mis there's a lot of people who don't quite understand what happened with P3 color. So I like really try to simplify it into the information that you need to know and really break it down. And Awesome. Yeah. So that's linked down below along with a whole bunch of other stuff. So uh, make sure if you're curious about anything to go and check out the links in the description. And speaking, I guess, uh, you know, of new features there too, um, when say you mentioned actually a lot earlier, the new switch attribute um, for checkboxes that I think is just in the new technical preview now for Safari. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and technology preview, Safari technology preview. Yeah, and just actually going way back to the very beginning when we were talking about keeping up with the new stuff coming out. One thing mm -hmm. I do is usually just look at the change logs of you know the tech, the, the 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 preview there as well as like the Firefox nightly and Chrome Canary because that's always like cutting edge, like experimental sometimes stuff. But yeah. it gives you an idea of where where the future is going sometimes. Yeah. Um, with the switch attribute, is that something that's actually in the spec right now, or is that Oh, yeah. So it's interesting because different working groups work differently. So the CSS working group, for example, masonry, mm -hmm. um, that was an idea that the working group discussed, or maybe I should use that one example, but in, in anything, the working group will, somebody will come along with a new idea and they'll say, hey, I have this new idea. I think we should work on this thing. And the working group will discuss it and sort of say, Every decision is a resolution at the CSS working group. And it's very formal. Like, you know when a re resolution has been called and everyone can, anybody can speak up and say, no, I object. That's a no for me. <laughs> and so if, if nobody's saying no, then it's a yes. And so there's a resolution to say, yeah, we, you know, we like this idea. We like this space. We think this is a good thing maybe we'll pursue. And an editor's draft will get started. So there is an editor's draft. You can go mm -hmm. read an editor's draft at any moment. The editor's draft is never the official, like that's not the official web standard, but it's a good place to see the very latest version of the web standard and where the web standard is probably going. And then the working CSS working group will get to a place where the, the spec is, at a, is mature enough where the working group resolves to create what's called a first public working draft, where now there's an official web standard. It's called the word first public working draft and then as it gets revised, it's the working draft. And then there's a journey on, it goes on where it becomes a candidate recommendation and eventually a recommendation. Um, and in order to graduate through those higher levels, it has to get implemented in browsers. Um, so by the time something gets to rec, to recommendation stage, it's basically done. It's done, the spec is done. It's in all the browsers, the browsers are done. And it's sort of just frozen in time of like, here's the official recommendation. The HTML working group, or it's not HTML working group, the WhatWig working group that that uh, is the keeper of the HTML specification, is just has a different operating procedure. So 
CSS used to have one document. There was just CSS2. Everything was in CSS2. But it was getting to be such a huge, massive document, and it was so hard to keep track of what was changing or to make decisions to change things or, or to move things from working draft to candidate to, like, you couldn't... You had to wait till the whole thing was ready and then move it to the next level. So the CSS working group decided to break it into a whole bunch of separate specifications. So that's why you have all of these different, you've got backgrounds and borders over here, and you've got, you know, fonts level one over here, and you've got CSS grid over there, and like everything's a different spec. Where HTML, everything is still in one giant document. And so when new things are created, they're not just put straight into the HTML specification. They actually go into a pull request, and the pull request Mm -hmm. is discussed in detail by the group, all the details are worked out. And then it actually has to get implemented by two browsers before it can go into the specification, which is, it's just different, right? Mm-hmm. So no, Switch is not in the spec yet, but it has to get implemented first before, like the HTML, the HTML web standard is more of a record of what is already shipped than it is uh, record of the consensus of things that haven't shipped yet. But it is on the standards track, and that's very important. Like, it's not like we went rogue and just made something up and we're like, whatever, YOLO, we're just going to ship it. Um, Which, you know, we could do. Sometimes browsers do do that. Um, Or other, you know, some, there's always a conversation. Sometimes there's a very clear objection where one or more browsers or other folks involved say, no, we have very strong concerns about this. We Hmm believe this has privacy implications that we're not okay with we don't we think this is too much of a security risk to ship this api on the web um no and then another browser will go ahead and ship it anyway it's like well they totally have the right to do that they they can ship whatever they want but it's not a web standard and it and there may be a document and there might be a spec and people might want it web developers might be asking for it but it's still not a web standard because there was no consensus and there was an objection and you know some of us really care deeply about privacy and security and sometimes it means you can't have nice things that there are very good use cases that makes us all wish we could ship it but if it's got privacy implications then it might not be worth it so switch is on the standards track it you know i i think there's no reason to expect that it won't be part of the standard there has been a lot of discussion about it uh, both at the HTML in, in the Wetwig and also at CSS Working Group because there's two pseudo elements that go with it. Um, so basically, what is Switch? You might be familiar, especially if you go to the settings in your operating system, where a lot of times there's a toggle where instead of it looking like a checkbox where you turn something on and off, it's a little slider with a little knob and you can drag it back and forth and maybe when you drag it one direction it turns gray and you drag it the other direction it kind of lights up and turns green very common interface at this point there's nothing built into html or built into the web to do that the closest thing to that is to use a checkbox so a lot of people who are building web apps or other kinds of interfaces and they want to have switch controls They'll build a checkbox, they'll use a checkbox, they'll input type equals checkbox, and then they'll apply a bunch of custom CSS or sometimes even custom JavaScript to make it visually look different. Um, But sometimes there's privacy, I mean, I'm sorry, accessibility considerations where you think you did it well, but actually it's not accessible because the hacks, the giant piles of hacks you had to use. This is a way to say, let's just get the browser to do the work. Let's get the browser to, instead of drawing a checkbox, let's have the browser draw a switch control. And rather than making a different element, because again, progressive enhancement is really important and figuring out a path forward and what's the fallback. And so basically you use input type equals checkbox, and then you add an attribute called switch. And as soon as you write the word switch in there, in the browsers that have support, which right now is Safari, Safari Technology Preview, um, it will just magically appear as a switch instead of appearing as a checkbox. And then there are two pseudo elements. I forget the names of them. Sorry, I should have looked it up. But um, you can style that switch. I mean, and I've seen some examples where it's so completely different. Um, one of our engineers made some examples, and it's like when it's off, it's like the background is a night sky with a moon and when it's on it's like turned into the daytime with a sun 
Um, or maybe you want the circle that is the slider to be far larger, or maybe you want to change the colors of, that it changes to, or whatever. Um, hopefully, there'll be a lot there so people can customize it if you want to make it look like your own brand. Yeah, so it's just an example. There's lots of examples these days of realizing, gosh, we could add more to HTML to create the kind of functionality that people want instead of people who are making websites having to build it from scratch over and over and over and over again. I think a lot of people are looking forward to that. <laughs> it's the, the yeah. those new additions and stuff that are being thought about on that side. Because, yeah, I remember doing I was doing a switch for a video one time, and I was just like, you know, as you said, it, I, this won't be too bad. And then I was like, oh my goodness! And then you're looking at the accessibility, you're going through everything else, and you're just like, this should. How is this not something that's just there? <laughs> you know, that I could just come in and, and make a change to. Um, yeah. When, yeah. One thing I was wondering with the switch, just because it was cool, and it's like, oh, it's pushed in the the technology technological preview, and I was just like, I, and not hearing about it coming from other places. Um, and you explained it a bit there with how it sort of goes through the process, but I'm just wondering, like, say somebody at Safari comes up with the idea, or there's a, someone at Chrome comes up with another idea, and they want to push something or push an idea forward without you know doing it, trying to get everyone on board and everything, just. Is there ideas that just come straight from the browsers? And I guess like how much influence or, or of the, these new things like the switch just come from one of the browsers being like, hey, why don't we do this? Really the process when it works at its best, um, it's often browser teams that have ideas that know, sometimes because there's projects inside the company or sometimes because, for example, WebKit supports all sorts of um, not just browsers, but other apps. There's mail, mm. books. Um, there's all sorts of apps that Apple has that run WebKit. There's all sorts of other... If you go to the Apple Store, I think there's a million apps using um, WebKit on the Apple's App Store. Um, it's used all over the place. So there's often times... And I, I'm sure that the same is true for other browsers, like... Chromebooks, for example, run Chromium. Like, there's oft often times that there's reasons to um, want to add technology to to the, a, a browser engine, um, and also by doing research and learning and listening and saying, um, you know, OpenUI I know has done that a lot, where they've talked to frameworks and said, you know, looked at frameworks and been like, oh, these things are being it got invented and put into frameworks. Same thing that happened with nesting. Like, why did nesting happen? Well, because Everybody was using SAS because they wanted to be able to nest their CSS, right? So um, sometimes it's people who don't work for a browser company who are involved in a working group um, who work on the specs, specification, but often it is, it's is—it's browser engineers. So the way it really should work is that that browser engineer might start implementing and messing around and seeing whether or not it's even possible in the first place because things have gotten so complicated today. There often is a question of like, can we actually do this? Has languished for 25 years because engineers did not believe it was actually technically possible until somebody at WebKit on, our, on my team like finally sat down one day because a golly kept talking about it. They're like, I'm going to look at this one more time. And they cracked it. They figured out how to make has work and make it fast enough. Um, or with nesting, that was the big debate last year. Um, was we didn't really think we were going to be able to have it look ahead. And without look ahead, you ha you couldn't have an element selector. You'd have to stick something like an ampersand in front of an yep, element. Yep. And, but finally, somebody figured out, I think it was somebody at Google maybe, or I forget which team, but like somebody figured out how to make that happen. Um, no, I think it was Mozilla. I don't know. Somebody figured it out, how to make it happen. Um, so there is that kind of necessary incubation, debate, conversation. Um, I mean, we're, we've been working on model for a while, the model element, so that on the spatial web, you've got the video element, you've got the image element, you then will have the model element work very similarly, where you can point to a 3D model and have it appear. It will work, it will work on every browser, on every device. You, you, you can do similar things with AR Quick Look on iPads today. But that on Vision Pro, it would actually be part of that 3D environment. So we've been working on it internally, writing up documents internally, having conversations about it, and then proposing it to the working group. So that's really how it, it should work, is that a browser team doesn't want to get ahead of the web standards process. Mm -hmm. That at some point, you go to the appropriate working group and you propose it. And you say, 
here's something that we've got. Maybe it's an early idea. Maybe it's a well fleshed out specification. Really better if we collaborate and we work together and we use each other's teams to be like, hey, this is the best idea that we could come up with, but can you look at this and can you help us make it better? Because you also have a lot of smart people over there and you know, this team tends to think about things in this from this point of view and this other team tends to think about things from this other point of view. And It's not just the browser makers, it is a whole bunch of other players, like for example, as I mentioned before, Adobe. Or, um, there's some book publishers that are involved in the CSS working group. There's um, you know, a bunch of people who are they're thinking about print, right? They're, they're people who represent all kinds of companies, and they're all they all care about the web. So it's like kind of representing all of the different needs and all the different ideas. And um, it is a place as well where, you know, a lot of uh, my colleagues across the industry, other developer relations people, talking about things on podcasts or um, writing blog posts or. Um, if you're interested and you sort of look at things that are being debated before they're done, and then you can chime in as a designer or developer. Because many of us who are working on the standards in the browsers used to be designers and developers, but we haven't been making websites for a while. So like, tell us what it's like now making a website um, and what it is that you need and why it is you reach for this framework and what the web could do for you to make it easier. And, um, jump in and say, but also with care and empathy and kindness and realizing that there's some real complexity in the engine that you probably don't realize are in things like how fonts are made or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, uh, speaking of, of sort of how we get to that stage, is there anything new or exciting sort of behind the scenes right now going on at Safari that you could share with us? Yeah, well, we are working on model. We're working on switch control. We're working on... Um, a lot of what I mentioned, like masonry mm -hmm. layout, right? So masonry layout um, is a standard that Mozilla put together in 2019, 2020, and they implemented the first idea of it behind a flag in Firefox Nightly. Um, and then over at Safari, we've, we've, we, we think it's a good, solid need. So we picked up the the work and implemented it in Safari Technology Preview and the spec has since evolved. Some things that were in it that don't seem necessary got removed and some other details got worked out. And So now it's in Safari Technology Preview. But there's still some debates going on. There's still some questions. Some people have questions about like, do we really need to do it at all? Or should it be part of grid? Should it actually be part of its own display type, like display masonry instead of display grid, grid template columns masonry, or grid template rows masonry? Um, so yeah, like there are conversations that happen. Last year and the year before, where there were a bunch of conversations publicly about nesting, like, yeah. hey, there are these three options. Which ones do you like better? Can you answer this one question survey? Um, those can really help. Getting input from people who make websites can really help when the working groups are in a little bit of a like haven't yet made the decision. And the debate just keeps going around in circles or something. Because we really are there to serve people who make websites. And people who make websites are really there to serve the people who use the web. Um, and the people who use the web are really the ones that matter. So it's a, it's a way to figure out what is best is to, is to involve the people who make websites. And it really does make a difference. We'll, we'll finish things up with uh, a bit of a different type of question, just because you've been involved yeah. in the web so long and you've seen it evolve a lot um, and been a big part of that evolution uh, in, in helping sort of spearhead some of the big changes we've seen. Uh, but I'm really curious if, if, especially with the pace of change, I guess, being faster now, as yeah. we've sort of alluded to a little bit, um, if you'd be willing to venture a guess at where CSS and not even just CSS, but the web in general might be looking in, say, three yeah. to five years from now. Yeah, I mean, in some ways, five years is nothing, right? It's going to be the same web we have now. Um, but in some ways, the area that really captures my imagination and makes me think, wow, I had no idea this, is, this could break open into something really amazing is the spatial web. Like right now, Safari is real Safari. It's running WebKit, and it's got all of the things. It's got all the CSS, HTML, JavaScript, everything that Safari has is in Safari on Vision Pro. But they, there's, there, there's possibilities for more. Um, I know WebXR is something that people are very excited mm -hmm. about. It's, it is in progress. I think it's still behind a flag. There are some things about the 
web XR specification that needed to evolve because, you know, it wasn't designed with hands in mind and that kind of user interaction. But it's, you know, it's happening. Um, and the model element is a sort of clear, obvious, uh, to get 3D models onto the web as, as real content. Um, but then there's so much more that could be done with CSS around, you know, what does it really mean to be able to style something and have it interact with that kind of an environment on a level that we just haven't seen before. So um, there's there's nothing to talk about yet, but I think there's some really mind-blowing possibilities that are quite different. I think one of the real strengths of the web is that it's declarative. So it seems more obvious how to get kind of programmatic things into 3D space to be able to like, you know, write very complicated code and, you know, things like WebXR and and USDG models and such. But like, what about declarative web being part of the spatial web and being able to declare that you want this or that to have this or that kind of styling in that space and then let the let the computer do the work. Like it's like that. It's like we haven't even imagined it yet. We haven't even the 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 world of web designers and developers are still still in some ways trying to wrap their head around responsive web design. Yeah. Still trying to wrap their heads around grid. It's like well, get that under your belt because uh, <laughs> there's it's... a whole other dimension coming. Literally a whole other dimension coming. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, so. I'm out of questions, but is there anything I didn't ask you that you'd want to talk about or mention or bring up uh, before we... Well, I yeah, a couple things. So Safari Technology Preview, which we've talked about, alluded to a lot, right? So that's the preview browser. It shows you what's coming in Safari. Um, it's a great browser for developers to use. It has the latest developer tools in it. And it comes out, you know, if you look at the pattern over the last year, at least in the last year, it's basically come out every two weeks. And it may be not holidays, but like the rest of the time. So it's, if you want to know what's coming, webkit.org is the place to go. Every two weeks, there's uh, new release notes that tell you what it is that's landed. Um, and if you have a Mac, you can run it on your Mac side by side with regular Safari. So you can use regular Safari for your own browsing and use Safari Technology Preview for development or testing or something. Um, and there's also flags, right? So there are feature flags. Uh, they used to be in the menu, but we moved them into settings. You do have to turn on developer features in mm -hmm. Safari, which sometimes strips people up. If you're a developer, like go into settings and find the place where it says in the advanced or whatever, and it says turn on developer features and check that checkbox. And when you do, you get a whole new menu called the develop menu. The web inspector will start to work and there'll be new sections in settings and then you can find the feature flags in there. Because Web Inspector works with iPhone. Like if you have a physical iPhone in your space, you have a physical iPad, or now if you in the future soon, very soon have a physical I, a physical Vision Pro in your space, you can use Web Inspector on your Mac to directly inspect something that's in a Safari window on any of those devices. And we overhauled how that works in the last, last year. We shipped it all in Safari 17.0, uh, 17.1 in yeah, 17.0 in September. And um, so you can basically like take your iPhone, plug it in with a cable the first time, just for security reasons or whatever, and pair it. And then from then on, you never have to use a cable again. You can just pick up your iPhone, you can open a web inspector window. There's a place in the develop menu where your iPhone will just get listed and you can just tell it which window you want to open and you can use the web inspector and use your iPhone and like very easily debug directly on mobile devices and on Vision Pro. Um, which is something that I think not enough people know about and is a real, something that where Safari can really help you by just getting you directly onto those devices. Um, but also, if you don't have devices, maybe you have an iPhone, but you don't have every iPhone. <laughs> maybe you need to test iPhone SE, maybe you have an iPhone 15 or something, um, or you don't have every size of iPad, or maybe you don't have a Vision Pro yet. You can use simulators. So if you download Xcode, it comes with some simulators, but you can also download even more simulators. You can download whichever ones you want, and you can throw away the ones you don't want to use so you can not use up as much space on your drive. And um, and then from Web Inspector, you can open things in a simulator and inspect right in that simulator. 
Um, and responsive web design mode is is handy. It's a, it's it's clearly much faster to use. So just if you want to check out your mobile your mobile layout or whatever. But what is interesting about responsive web design modes in any browser is that they don't actually emulate the operating system, and so the fonts are not probably not the right size, and the even if you get it to the right number of pixels and width, the way things lay out is different. So using a simulator can really help you like see what it's actually going to look like on a phone or a device that you don't have. Um, plus you have, you know, if it has anything to do with media or anything to do with color or anything to do with your bug with anything else in the stack, you actually get to see it in the correct operating system with the right, all of the right technology. Um, and Vision Pro, you can, the simulator has been out since July. Um, if you want to check it out and see what Safari looks like inside the Vision OS simulator. You can run that on your Mac and get an experience of what that's like. Um, so that session uh, about, I think it's called Rediscover the Develop Menu, um, it has all kinds of information. It just shows you exactly step by step how to do all of those things. And then I would just recommend WebKit.org in general. Like every time we put out a version of Safari, we write one of these long articles that walks you through every single feature. Um, there's also other articles about other technology. Just a great resource. There's documentation about Web Inspector. If you look at the menu bar of WebKit.org, there's all kinds of links in there, including links to all the documentation for Web Inspector that shows you exactly how it works. And um, there's good information out there to be had. And there we have it. A huge thank you to Jen for being so generous with her time. And as a reminder, there are links to everything that we've talked about and more in the description down below. Thank you so much for listening. I really hope that you enjoyed that. Jen, thank you once again for your time. And of course, everybody, until next time, don't forget to make your corner of the internet just a little bit more awesome.